So it's 11 o'clock and welcome to this latest edition of the Virtual Bridge Sessions. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be joined by Ailey here who has all of the answers when it comes to learning and teaching online. Am I overselling that, Ailey? Am I, because uh, I Totally overselling talk. it, as I told you, <laughs> not managing expectations well at all. <laughs> well, my confidence levels are high. I believe you have the answers. And look, look, I've, I've even brought some paper to note them all down. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope we can offer you something. <laughs> right. Well, over to you and uh, tell us more about online learning and teaching. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. Uh, let me get my slideshow and then I'll just get started. Are you seeing that okay now? We're yes. In full we're in full screen. <clears throat> okay, perfect. So uh, thanks, Kenji, for the introduction and for inviting me along to this virtual bridge today. Um, so as I said when I was chatting with you earlier, uh, I'm Programme Leader for uh, the Online BSc Sustainable Development Programme, which is one of UHI's longest running uh, online and distance learning programmes. Um, it's been around in different forms for 25 years. Um, first as rural development, now as sustainable development. Uh, I've been working on the programme for 10 years, as we said, uh, 11 in fact. I'm going to talk a little bit about my own kind of experience. Um, so uh, Kenji had asked us to all choose a song for today. Um, my song choice for today was Hot Right Now. Uh, you know you're only in it because you're hot right now. Well, I know I'm only here because online learning and teaching is hot right now. Uh, but having said that, I know many of you may have been teaching in online education for some time. Um, some might just be adapting to it now. Um, so it'd be great to hear your thoughts on... Um, I'm just wondering if I can stop these subtitles appearing <laughs> as I talk. That's better. Um, so hopefully the question answered in the end will be able to... Um, chat through some of what you guys are doing as well. And as I said, as somebody who's employed by a college, but mainly teaching on higher education courses at the moment, um, hopefully we can share some ideas across the whole range of tertiary education. So today, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about some things that I think are the key elements when um, online learning and teaching. Um, and as I tell my students, no definitive answers, no right answers, um, just points for discussion. Um, and I've broken it down into three kind of elements. Um, so the three of the things that I think are quite important when you're teaching online and just wanted to break it down this way just so we could go through them all. So the pedagogy, the practicalities and thinking a bit about personalities. Um, so first of all, in terms of the pedagogy, um, anyone who's been teaching online for a while will know that, you know, we don't want to replicate face to face. It shouldn't be the same as face to face. It's a different kind of environment. Students will work differently. You'll work differently. There's opportunities and challenges that come with that. Um, so we tend to say that you're moving from being the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. So that basically, I know a lot of universities are moving this way and colleges too, um, where you don't have a lecturer um, who just stands up and talks to students for an hour um, without any kind of interaction. So on the online environment, it's even more kind of pronounced. Um, we provide the students with what we would say are kind of lecture notes um, every week in a kind of PDF format or a PowerPoint format or something like that. So the students do the reading up of all that before they, they come to any sessions with us, before they do any activities. Um, and the role of the, the tutor is really to scaffold their knowledge. We provide the information, we work them through it, we give them you know, um, reading videos, podcasts, and point them to certain things in that that they can use to enhance their learning. And then we take them together either in a kind of um, synchronous or asynchronous way to talk through that. Um, the things that they've been learning about. I'll talk about that in a minute. So the idea is, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the flipped classroom. Um, Douglas obviously uh, was saying he's um, an expert in blended learning, so he'll know all about this. Um, the idea is that the students can prepare in advance. Um, the studies, you know, quite a lot of it is self-directed. Um, so we give them a lot of information, but we guide them through it. And one of the main things about it is that it's intended to be kind of collaborative. This is the approach that we kind of take. So the emphasis is really on learning from each other. So as I said, the tutor doesn't have all the right answers. We're there to help work them through things, help them think about things, test ideas on each other. And we've been really lucky to have a great, you know, cohort of students uh, through the years um, who have their own experiences and bring their own, they come from all over the country, sometimes all over the world, and they bring their own kind of experiences and knowledge to to the learning and to, you know, so they learn a lot from each other as much as from the from what they learn from the, the tutors. Um, so in terms of, you know, activities, um, 
we, as I said, we do a range of activities, synchronous and asynchronous. So things that are kind of live um, where we all meet together at the same time or other things that the students can work on a bit more flexibly. Um, so in our live sessions, we really focus on making them kind of interactive student participation. As I said, not the tutor or the lecturer talking the whole time. Um, we try to get them involved. We get we ask questions, put them into little groups. Um, there's lots of tools and things that you can use these days for, for that kind of thing. Um, again, the th I suppose the thing is um, when you're teaching live, you, you can't expect to maybe do as many live online sessions as you would face to face. Anyone who's been on Zoom a lot in this lockdown knows how tiring it can be uh, being on a video screen all day long. So you wouldn't necessarily expect to be able to schedule as many live sessions as you maybe would face to face. Um, and you need to take breaks, um, give the students a range of activities so you're not just talking, you know, and not giving them a chance to get a little rest. Um, so there's different tools we, we tend to use. We've got a virtual learning environment that we use and there's tools involved in that. We use WebEx meetings. There's lots of little tools in that, like polls, um, breakout rooms. You can get students to annotate their slides. There's other external tools that you can use. I'm sure a lot of you will maybe, especially the JUSC, Just colleagues will have a lot of um, ideas of different things you can use for this. Some that we've looked at are things like Answer Garden, Turning Point, point Mentimeter. Um, although I have to say at UHI, we're really encouraged to try to focus on using our internal um, sort of software and things that are within the VLE rather than really looking for sort of external things. Um, so they're all, they're all the things you can use when you're sort of live with your students. Um, but a lot of our work is done in asynchronous activities because we've got a lot of mature students um, who want to do it flexibly. They don't necessarily want to come to a live session during the day. They want to be able to do it when they can. So we record all of our live sessions so they can watch them whenever. Um, but then we also do a lot of activities that can be done at any point during the week. So again, we, we use a virtual learning environment. Others who are maybe using Teams or um, different software like that may have different um, tools. But we mainly use discussions and we do a lot of different activities in our discussions. There's also the possibility to do things like quizzes and surveys, blogs, wikis, and we've used different tools like this over the years to get the students to be able to participate as and when they can. And so we usually set a time frame. And, and as I'll talk about in a minute, we try to link them to the content and the assessments if, if possible. Um, when I did this presentation before, I was really uh, asked um, the focus, you know, they were what the, the group that I was doing it for were looking for kind of tools and what kind of tools to use. But I think for me, the, the main thing is, you know, not to use a lot of tools just for the sake of it. Don't go, you know, using polls, breakout rooms, complicated things if it's not adding something. Um, I know myself, I got excited with WebEx meetings and thought, oh, this is wonderful. I'm going, you know, in one session, I tried to do a poll, a breakout room annotation. Some of the students couldn't get the annotation working. Um, you know, the poll took a wee while to, to load up. Um, and in the end, actually, our session was much better when I just simply used the video audio, had a chat, gave them, you know, little tasks to do. Um, so I think the most important thing is really, you know, the tools can be good and they can break the session up, but don't just use them for the sake of it. The most important thing is really getting a connection with the students, letting them connect with each other, sharing information and helping them to think kind of critically. Well, certainly in our subject area, I guess it may be, there may be some subject areas where there's more of a focus on um, actually retaining knowledge, um, particular, um, say, formulas. But for, for us, it's really about critical thinking. Um, and so I think the tools, while they can be useful, I do think it's more important to think about your students and um, the, the connections between them. So I wanted to just say a little bit about assessments. Um, I know it's not possible for everyone. I know some of the... Um, maybe particularly FE courses, you know, the assessments can be a little bit more prescribed or the content can be a bit more prescribed. Um, we are quite flexible. We're able to change our assessments um, and we're able to do things differently. But if you, if you can, if you're moving to all online and you can rethink your assessments, I think it's really worth thinking about how the assessments fit in with the teaching because um, we've moved away completely as a lot of the courses at um, UHI have from exams. Partly because of kind of practicalities, we've got people all over the place and we'd have to figure out invigilation. Um, sometimes we've got people in different parts of the world, so you're talking about time zones or things like that. Um, so practically, it can be a little bit more tricky to do that online. But also, you know, pedagogically, I think we've found that some of these more continual assessment and uh, more practical sort of tasks um, can 
fit better with some of our materials than, than maybe exams do. And with the way, I guess, the way that education is going um, as well, there's, there's quite a long, lot of people arguing against um, the sort of exam system. Not that I would discount it completely, but um, there, there are definitely advantages of doing things based on continual assessment and essays and reports and things like that. So um, what we try to do, I mean, students are rational creatures like ourselves, and they like to see that um, that the activities that they're doing are going to count for something. So what we try to do is within our kind of um, weekly tasks, um, we try to let that contribute towards their assessment. So for example, some of the things that we've done um, in the last few years is we've got them to compile glossaries together based on the kind of weekly materials that we've been looking at, um, timelines, maybe looking at key dates, um, and they, they pull that together. They can, they've done blogs, they've done debates with each other um, based on the weekly kind of topics, audio enhanced presentations, multiple choice questions, and we also do some student-led seminars where that's part of their assessment. Um, so, as I said, you know, they, they want to focus on things that get results, so we try to set up our assessments to enhance that kind of continuous engagement. Um, so that they have to check in with us um, and with each other every week to, to, to do part of the assessment. But we don't, um, I should maybe have said, we don't, when it comes to our um, live sessions, we don't take a, a register or anything like that. Um, it's not compulsory to attend our live, our live sessions. As I said, they're recorded. Um, we've had a lot of debates about that over the years about whether we should potentially um, make them compulsory um, and I know when I worked at other universities, there was a lot, always a lot of discussion about that, um, but we, we haven't done that. So we try to factor in um, ways of keeping their engagement, but in a different way um, through their assessments. And we also do sort of more typical things like essays, reports. We put quite a lot of emphasis, as I said, sustainable development. So it's across a lot of subject areas. So we quite often do policy briefs and things that are a bit more practical um, for what students may be doing in the real world. Um, so that's the assessment um, ideas that, that we we use. So moving on to the from the pedagogy to the kind of practicalities, um, just a couple of things that I've um, really thought are important over the years that I've been teaching and that we've heard from students make a big difference. So one of the things is um, students really appreciate if you can be organized and consistent. Um, so I would really one of the things that we try to do in our course is to try and encourage a similar look to the course. So um, we try to have you know, the same kind of icons for each module, um, the same structure. So there's learning resources, there's assessments and there's module information in all of our modules. So whether you're doing it on a VLE or even if you're doing it by email, um, if you can be consistent. I know myself even from homeschooling, um, I know that um, my, obviously, I said I had three kids, so they all had a different teacher. And the teacher that we found um, easiest to follow what was going on was the one that we knew was always going to send an email at half past nine every morning, that there was always the same structure, there were three activities. Um, so I think, you know, it really does help if you've got a, a clear structure and that's consistent across every across every week and ideally across your whole course if, if you can. And we, we post weekly announcements um, of what's expected from students and when, so what, you know, what the weekly tasks are, what are we doing this week, what do you have to read, um, are we having a tutorial this week, um, and I think that helps keep students on track, because um, particularly online, I know when our students come first come onto the course, they can be a little, um, it's quite overwhelming, I know myself from coming into um, lockdown and people are using Teams and people are using Zoom and we are using WebEx and it does take a little bit to get used to these different um, systems. So when students come in and they're trying to get used to the VLE, um, we find that it definitely helps um, them to, it's one less thing to worry about if things all look the same, um, if the technology's spelled out and if you know it's kind of clear what they've got to do. Um, as I was saying to Kenji there when he was um, uh, emphasizing how much I was gonna have all the answers, I think it's really important to manage expectations, not just so of your own role and of what students can and should do. Um, so if you can let students know what your role will be, um, one of the student, one of the modules I teach is on a master's um, in sustainable rural development. And in one of my modules, the discussion forum is the main way that we communicate with students. And um, I set out at the beginning that actually, you know, um, my role is to facilitate, to steer, to prompt, to keep you on the right track, move forward discussions. I'm not gonna come in and give you the right answer. I'm not gonna wade into every post that's made. Um, most of the discussion will be between, between you 
and that definitely helped. Um, when I hadn't made that so clear in the year before, our students had said, the tutor's not doing enough, the tutor's not, you know, telling us the right answer. Um, you know, I could have done with more support from the tutor. But the next year when I made clear, that's not what I was going to do. Everyone was happy with that. They understood the premise of it. They, they could see why, you know, I was doing what I was doing and what they were supposed to do. And it really helped. Um, the other thing is, it's important to manage expectations of the students, what they can and what they should do. As I said, be clear on what you know you want them to do um we have a lot of mature students in our course um people coming back to learning after a while i guess because of the flexibility of online online study um and they've got quite often a lot of commitments they've got high expectations of themselves um and we have to emphasize you can only do what you can do in the time you have available sometimes your life will get in the way um you might not perform as well as you think you can just keep going you know when it really matters you're you know you'll you'll be able to pull it out the bag um but just a pass is a pass that's good enough so you know sometimes you've just got to manage expectations and help them realize that you know they, they can't get perfection every time particularly you know studying online can be kind of a lonely experience um and you can i know even myself working at home how other things creep in and how or how work can take over your whole week um so you've got to help them to kind of understand what they can only do what they can do um the other thing i suppose is um we have to help them figure out how to behave online um we have uh, an etiquette guide how to behave online and how to you know participate well in discussions um we all know that people do and say things online that they wouldn't do or say in the real world you only have to look at twitter for <laughs> evidence of that um so I think sometimes things can be misconstrued. So um, we try and, you know, give this guide to students of, uh, you know, don't use capital letters when your posts, jokes don't always work. And, you know, when you're writing in a discussion forum, people might not get what you're saying if you use sarcasm. So, you know, things like that, just little tips on, um, you know, how do you smooth your communications over as you're, as you're online. Um, so, and the last thing I wanted to talk about was personalities. Um, you know, when we're on the screen, I think it's important to remember we're all, we're all still human, uh, although sometimes it doesn't always feel like you're a human when you're on the screen. Um, so I think it's really important to encourage people to kind of share their personalities and kind of get to know people the same way you would in a face-to-face -face, um, environment. We always start things off, you know, trying to get to know, you know, what makes our students tick with various different icebreakers and, you know, introductory exercises and, and that sort of thing. I think it's important also to think about your cohort. <coughs> As I said, um, you know, being an on online program, an entirely online program, we sometimes do get students who, you know, come to our course because they, they don't necessarily want to work in a group. They quite like just doing their own thing and working through things, you know, at their own pace. Um, not necessarily wanting to really be sociable with lots of other people. Maybe they don't have time. So I think it's important to kind of get to know that group. I mean, we're quite fortunate. We don't have a huge cohort, so we can get you know to know our students. But you know, ask how they want to communicate and get to know what works for them. And the other thing we try to do is encourage interaction between the students. So obviously, we're, we're encouraged to encourage them to do that within the university system. So we use our discussion forums and all of that sort of thing. We have a course hub that's a kind of informal space for them to chat to each other as well um, but they also have their own Facebook group um, that the staff aren't involved in and it is quite good for them to have that environment where you're not you know able to be involved with that so I know this year they've also set up a WhatsApp group um, with their student society so I think these things can can really help we hold a residential once every year as well to try and get together face to face with them if we can so I think all these things help <coughs> and the last thing um, is to kind of think about mental health uh, I was involved in a project with two colleagues um, from Newcastle College UHI where we created a mental health toolkit. Um, so it's for staff and it was basically because we'd had the experience of teaching people online who we knew had mental health conditions and they had been, you know, um, they had support in place. But as staff, as academic staff, we didn't always really know, well, what does that mean? You know, how, how will that manifest itself in class? So we put together this mental health toolkit that's available to all staff at UHI. In fact, it's an open resource and it's available to all colleges, universities, anybody who, who wants to, to use it. Um, just explaining what some different conditions are and what that might look like face-to-face -face and what it might look like online, because I think it is quite different online. Um, you know, how things, how you communicate, how you're able to, I mean, for example, sometimes, you know, your students, if they don't answer your email, um, 
if they don't you know come to classes it's a little bit more difficult to gauge you know what's going on in their lives um so we've tried to put this toolkit together um to help academic staff particularly to understand what um how and how we can help students you know that do have mental health issues and i think you know everyone is thinking a lot more about mental health with this lockdown and everybody being at home and i think that's really important to, but also in terms of thinking of your own mental health when you're teaching you know online or working at home because it does creep in you know to extra parts of the day maybe um, that it didn't used to and it can you know without having colleagues maybe around to share it with it can be quite um a lot to take on so you know i think it's important to think about that and so my my main tips, as I said, definitely don't have all the answers, um, not at all, um, just some experiences of what we've been doing in, um, in our course and um, the main tips for me are just keep it simple, um, try to keep it kind of friendly, just be be, be normal um, as much as possible, be, be human um, and just keep an eye on everyone's well-being as much as you can. So that's that's my main tips, nothing groundbreaking, um, but hopefully you found that at least a little bit useful. Okay, Ailey, that that that's excellent, and <laughs> I I especially liked your your tip around consistency because I've always found that that works really really well, and, and I think that's a really useful piece of advice. Okay, and and you timed that excellently because we do have some time for for some questions. So does does anyone well anyone can think of a question that you'd like to ask uh, Ailey about her experiences and, and perhaps some of yours that you'd like to share. Um, and while you're thinking of something to say, I just want to ask Ailey, do you have any tips around that aspect of students working together in, in groups or in some collaborative elements and how you encourage and monitor those kind of activities? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, I think it's one that people ask a lot about um, you know, online and uh, how does group work? work. Um, there's a couple of things we do. Um, one thing I think that's quite been quite useful, that I know my colleagues that work with our geography team, they've got quite a good system set up about um, peer reviewing. Um, so they kind of get the students, it's quite complicated to be fair, but they do get the students to, um, part of the mark is based on kind of an, an individual Kind of contribution to it but also they then rate their student their fellow students so the others in the group they sort of say um well you know you didn't help that much so we're only going to give you you know six out of ten or whatever it is for that section and then that's kind of in a very complicated way compiled together to give an overall kind of rating for how much they got involved so it does sort of end up balancing it out so the people that are a wee bit less engaged get a wee bit less out of it but we have had a wee bit of discussion about whether that's the best approach or not or whether if you're in the group environment, you, you get a group mark. Um, so there's a bit of a mixed feeling about that. But in terms of actually getting them to participate, um, there are different ways we do it. We do break them down. One of the ones that works quite well is that we get them into you know pairs for a debate. Um, you can also, you can randomise the groups, but I think it also helps if you think about, if you know the students and put them in groups where you know that the kind of way of working kind of works better together, you know, there are students who it's all about study, they'll, you know, they're really well, you know, give it their all and they're, they're better being with someone else who'll, who'll do the same. Um, and, you know, if you, so you can match them up like that a little bit. Um, I think that helps that. And it, so it helps if you know your cohort um, in that way as well. So there's different ways that, you know, I think you can, can do it. I've got a module running just now where it's quite a large group and I just put them into small groups for discussion this week. And I think everyone's enjoying that change that, you know, the variety of, you know, working from the bigger group to the smaller group. So I think mixing it up helps as well. I don't know if that really fully answered the question. But yeah, no, 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 <laughs> that, that that sounds excellent. It sounds similar to a system called WebPA that we covered in, in one of our previous sessions uh, around allowing everyone to sort of gauge how everyone in the group was doing. It's a, it's a really, I, I think it's a really effective system, but can be hard to implement. Um, any any other questions for, for Ailey here? Um, feel free to unmute yourself. If you don't, I'll just keep asking questions. I warn you, I like the sound of my own voice. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, Kerr, do you have a question? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, hi, hi, Ellie. That, that was really interesting, by the way. Uh, I found it really useful. Uh, just for those that don't know me, uh, Kerr Gardiner, uh, I'm from just, just now, but I've got a long history in uh, e-learning and online learning. And one of the things, uh, topics which has come up uh, over recent months is around the use of external tools and GDPR 
etc. And I know that uh, some colleagues I've spoken to across the sector have said that they really are trying hard to make sure that people use the internal tools for all sorts of reasons. I'm uh, just wondering if there was any thoughts on that. Yeah, I kind of alluded to that a little bit in my presentation. We at UHI, we've got a list of approved technologies um, that you know we are encouraged to use. I think, as you say, I think GDPR can be an issue. One of the things, that's why things like Answer Garden, where you don't need an account or anything like that, you know, and you can just, you know, put up a link and people can add a comment and you don't have to, you know, log into anything or anything like that. I think that's maybe a to that kind of tool works, but there is definitely a danger with, uh, I know that a lot of our courses, if you want to use, say, you know, Facebook or Twitter or anything like that, um, you know, you, you do have to get permission from the university to do that um, and there has to be a good reason for why why you do that because because of the kind of complications that you've you've mentioned there so we are really encouraged and you know we 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 have this VLE that does have quite a lot of you know facilities in it personally I think it's lacking in a little bit in things like blogging or wikis and we've not really we've tried a few things over the years different wikis or different ways of blogging that we haven't found a great solution to, to that yet um, so if anybody's got any suggestions on that, it would be great. But yeah, we are really being encouraged to use yeah as much internal tools as possible. And as I say, I don't suppose, um, you know, you don't want to unnecessarily complicate things either. But, you know, um, internal is, is, is the, there's an approved list. And yeah, we have we have to really stick to that as much as possible. Sandy, you have a question. <laughs> Um, hi, Ailey, it's Sandy McLean from CDN. I just put a comment in the chat that um, I had circulated in the past your mental health toolkit far and wide and had various inputs at some of our network sessions and it would be useful to revisit it. But um, I think it's in a PDF format, isn't it? Or is there a, a link? Um, a link I I yeah, I'm sure I can find the link. It's, it's hosted by the UHI website at the moment, um, yeah. kind of openly. Um, so I should be able to find a link and yeah. share that. Um, I think what's um, particularly useful about it is it, um, it sort of complements other resources out there, but it particularly looked at the online element. And we, um, we showcased this well before pandemic time, but I think it's even more relevant now, especially as a lot of us are online. So I'll Thanks, I really appreciate uh, that and, and for sharing it. That's great. Yeah, I think that was, I mean, we, we got funding from Amoshi um, Student Services yeah. um, to do that. And I think it's important. I think that was what's really been missing in some of the you know, there's really good material out there, but as you say, not so much on the online front. That's so that right, was, yeah. I think, why we were able to get that funding. And I think it is, I think it still could be work done on it. I think we could progress it further, but I think, yeah, it was an, a good starting point for, mm -hmm. for looking okay. at that. Ailey, um, one topic that we've, we've discussed briefly um, in some of our previous sessions is in a, a synchronous online session like this, what's, what's your opinion around people sharing their cameras? What's your view? Is it important? Is it not necessary? What, what, what do you do? Well, it's funny, I was just talking to two colleagues. We all have a kind of regular Tuesday catch up on a, on a, a nine o'clock on a Tuesday morning. And I was just talking to a couple of colleagues there and we were discussing how, how our tutorials are going this year, our live sessions. And um, one of my colleagues was saying that actually um, her class, they don't want to use the video and audio, they use the chat facility. And she said at one point they had their videos on, but they were typing in the chat so she could see them, but they were they were typing and she was saying it was so weird. Um, but so anyway, they, they want to use the chat. So I mean, that, we tend to sort of ask the students, uh, we've got a recording policy at UHI, as I'm sure everyone does about, you know, you have to ask students, how do you feel about being recorded? Are you willing to be recorded? If you're not willing, turn off your camera and your microphone. So there's all of that. But we, we did, for years, we used the chat facility rather than the audio and video because we tended to have people in very rural areas who didn't have a great bandwidth. So we tried to sort of make it, you know, fair for everybody and we used the chat. But now that I think technology's come on, people are used to Zoom. This year in particular, we've done a lot of audio and video. And we don't say that students have to keep their video on, but we find that the majority of them, them do. Um, I know that sometimes some of the tutors have wanted to switch off the videos because we feel we can concentrate better when we don't have um, the distraction of looking at our own faces and we can, you know, ponder and look around and get a piece of paper and, you know, write something down. So sometimes um, I know some of the tutors have switched off their videos, but the students actually, I think, seem to be actually fairly OK with it. Um, and like I say, we don't say you have to or not, um, but it's very much their own choice. But most of them do seem to seem to do it. 
Okay, well, that's brilliant. And and that brings us to the end of this um, recorded session uh, for the Virtual Bridge uh, session. So if you're joining us on YouTube, we have to say goodbye to you. But we do hope you'll have time to join us at a future Virtual Bridge session. But that just leaves me um, to thank Ailey and everyone else who attended here for uh, today's session. I um, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> we certainly got something from it. And uh, I hope to see you again soon. So until then, stay safe. <laughs>